title, please. Kevin Russell, uh, co Corporate Controls Engineer for Hirschman Family Entertainment. Talk to me about Bureau. Well, I, I, I guess what I can best tell you about is, is the period from the first bankruptcy. I came in a couple years after that first bankruptcy up to what was, it wasn't really a true bankruptcy, but when, when the, uh, the principals that, that took the company out of that bankruptcy kind of lost control of the company. And um, we didn't have uh, very many of the original California people with us uh, at, at when I joined the company. At the time, I think we had we had Ron Drager in the shop. We had Steve Okamoto, which everybody knows. Uh, we had uh, Ron Toomer. Um, we uh, a, a gentleman called Dick Taylor that was the original uh, controls engineer. Interestingly. Dick was with the company longer than Ron Toomer, and was actually the re real original engineer. Um, Ron was the original, was the first engineer that was ever full time, but Dick worked part time before Ron did. So, um, uh, so you know, we had we had a few people, we had a few mentors, but most of the people that really knew the his or that 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 knew what the company had done before were gone, and so you had all these new guys. We were mostly young. Most of us had no previous amusement experience. We had a few people that had ski lift experience. Dal Freeman, we had uh, uh, Mark Doman who had come to us from the ski industry. So we had some people that had related experience, but not very many people that had amusement experience. So while we had all this, the, we had these files full of great projects and great, great, uh, uh, just all kinds of great rides that were in the files, but we didn't have very many people that had experience with it. And at about the same time, uh, of course, Schwarzkopf had died a few years before that, but out of the ashes of Schwarzkopf, B and M had risen, and all of a sudden they're starting to they're starting to, to be a force. They're they're starting to take projects away from us. And then two, Inman with Schwarzkopf being gone, Inman started doing more coasters, and and also Inman had some advantages because they had a real diverse product line, and they didn't do everything themselves. They used um, uh, Giovanola and. Um, I uh, can't remember the. What's that? The Interide? No, no. Um, this is this is before that. Um, there was a uh, there was a company that traditionally did bridges and and really large steel projects. They were the ones who really did the the uh, observation towers. Inman did not build the observation towers in house. So they they had those people that they were partnering with. And so they could do a lot of diverse big projects without actually doing a lot, having a lot of risk for Inman themselves. So, but I think those were the two companies that that uh, Ron was stalking as our as our competition, Inman and B and M. Well, B and M had a very tight focus. They they just did rides. That's all they worried about, and they would only do so many rides a year. They would not they would not try to take on just everything. Inman had all these partners, so they could do real broad, diverse, and do a lot of things. And Ron was trying to meet both models. So we're off doing in, in the time five and a half years I was there. We did Kong at Universal Studios. We did two monorails. Uh, we developed the shoot the shoot. They were working on the Virginia reel. They were working on pipeline. All these things, all these things that they're putting resources towards, they didn't have the highly experienced team that they'd had pre-bankruptcy. And so I, I, I kind of feel like what happened to us is too many resources were going to these fringe projects we weren't focusing enough on our on our coasters. I, I mean, Magnum was was really an aero mine train on steroids. It was not a new product. It was not it was not designed to go 201 feet. A lot of the changes that happened to, to Magnum were reactionary. After you already you know you put the, this train on this 201 foot tall lift and then you react to what happens. So we weren't developing our core product and we had our resources going to so many other projects and it just and you didn't have in in the early days when I got there we were all in in building G11 we were all together 
that la I that after about a month after I got there was when all of management moved over to H12 and shipping moved over there, all of that. So now, when I started, Ron would come walking through the engineering department. He'd look. Oh, you're on boards. You know, Ron's looking over people's shoulders, and he can say, "Hey, you know, we tried that. That didn't work." Why don't you go look at this project? We, we had a lot of that kind of thing going on. Well, when he moved across the street, we lost that. We still had Steve Okamoto, and, and Steve was fabulous. Steve was really, Steve almost worked two jobs because Steve would come in at, at he didn't come in until 10 o'clock. He had a little bit of a different work strategy than other people. But he would come in at 10 o'clock and he'd wander around the company all day long just talking to people. He knew exactly what was going on, but he did a lot of coaching. And then after everybody else left at 5 o'clock, then Steve would turn on the stereo, turn off all the lights, and that's when he started doing ride profiles. And there were times I came back, I came back from a trip one time at midnight. Unlocked the door, the stereo's blasting, and Steve's got, you know, couple ride profiles that he's that he's running through the HP um, but as we grew and we got into these things that were non coasters more and more Steve couldn't help as much with that either you know Dow, and as we got Dal Freeman was a great uh, great engineer but again as we grew bigger and bigger he could coach less and less so I think what happened really when we fell apart uh, after the kind of after the Vegas projects, the the people that brought us out of bankruptcy lost control of the company, and and I think it's because we got just too diverse and we were trying to do too much with 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 people that weren't as experienced as the giants from the golden age, you know, the the Morgan and Bacon time frame. That's wonderful, by the way. That's that's I can almost, that's gonna be tough to cut up because it's all great stuff. Um, that's that's the the best thing, the best worst thing I could possibly have is, is something like that. Talk to me a little bit about the real. How did that come about, and how far along did it get? The Virginia reel really happened. I, I came in just at the end of it. The test track was still standing. Uh, but I, I never got to see it run. So it, it, I think they tested it just like a couple months. They'd actually done the test runs before I got there. It was in the newsletter that, that, that came out just before I joined. But um, so they had a prototype. They had a section of track, probably 150, 200 feet long, that just did a drop. Um, it really came down to it was too hard to load and unload and, and get control of that situation. It's kind of the same problem you have with a rapids ride. How do you get the opening of the ride around to match up to the loading dock? And I think I think that was the biggest thing. But there were some engineering problems with that center spindle being able to take, you know, I mean, the, these newer rides, they had the advantage of more advanced materials and things than that we had at that point. And I just think they had a lot of trouble getting that center spindle to really take the loads and and be safe. So I don't think there was ever any, I, I don't think it ever got to the point of giving anybody a proposal. Talk about the pipeline. It's the one that a lot of people remember pipeline. because it was so different, uh, but it also never made it. So talk a little bit about that. Okay, so I actually did the, um, I, I actually, we, we did the pipeline prototype. I never got to ride it. I think that was that, that was really unfair because I did the little control system that we did for the test stand. Um, but it, it came down to, again, a problem with, with uh, the concept was wonderful, but you ended up with the wheels right by the people's head. It was, when they built the prototype, it was difficult to load. They ended up with that whole roll-up window thing to keep people, if, if someone had long hair, you had the same problem that you have with a go-kart. You know, their, their hair gets caught in the wheels. So they ended up with the whole roll-up window thing that, that added weight and added complication to the train. And it just, the concept was great, we just couldn't get the execution down. There was another prototype that we did out there too, by the way. Um, we actually had a, a, a prototype of a hydraulically launched roller coaster that we did for Universal Studios. We were actually going to, we, the prototype was done with a mine train car. We were going to launch it 
backwards down a hill. I mean, it wasn't a serious launch up a hill like some of these new things are, but we were actually going to launch the car backwards out of the station and then let it drop off a hill. Um, part of the problem there, we, we did the prototype two ways. We did it with a lap bar only, and then we did it with the over-the-shoulder restraint. Part of the problem with the lap bar is when you're launching backwards, of course, what happens is the people come forward and, you know, injuries happen. Uh, the over-the-shoulder restraint was just uncomfortable. I think Universal came and rode the prototype and they said it just, just didn't make sense. I, I don't think anything ever happened with that particular concept. So, But again, there's another fringe ride that we were spending resources on. Uh, that made it hard to focus on our core product. How many prototypes were created that just didn't make it? That, as you said, they sucked down the resources. Well, but I don't think it's just the ones that made it didn't make it. It's there's also some that made it, but didn't do well enough that you actually made your development cost back. And the monorails are a great example of that. We built the two monorails. We did not, there was nothing in common with those generation of monorails and the original monorails they did in the 60s. So we couldn't use anything that they'd originally done. Uh, we had to develop our own gearbox. We couldn't find a gearbox that would do what we needed to do. So we, we ended up developing our own. A lot of costs in developing that gearbox. The one in LA County, I think it ran for six, seven years, something like that. But it was low speed, it wasn't, it, it, it just wasn't exciting, it, did, it wasn't a good enough project to sell anything. And then we did the one in Vegas and we allowed the owner to contract to build the track. We, 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 there were a lot of problems with that track because of the temperature differential in Las Vegas between night and day. It had, had to have some extensive expansion joints. And uh, our, our civil engineer design, our structural engineer designed a fabulous expansion joint. It would have been wonderful. You never would have felt it. But it was, it was something that your local fab shop couldn't build. It had to be somebody that was really a qualified machine shop to build this. And they hired it out to, to a local fab shop. He also designed it for induction bent curves and they just welded up plate steel to make the curves. So the track started failing within the first two weeks. I mean, it actually was spitting bolts out. And so the ride ran maybe all of two weeks. So you had, and that, that I mean, that was it. You weren't gonna sell another monorail after, after a failure like that. So we had that, uh, the Virginia Reel, Pipeline, um, the uh, uh, cliffhanger. Bob's. Bob, the Bobs were well before me. That that was well before me. But yeah, I, I heard stories about that. The uh, the field engineer that I worked with a lot, a guy named Jimmy Nickel. Um, he or no, actually, it was Dick Taylor told me. Dick Taylor was wonderful for telling stories about about failed rides. He had he had all kinds of stories from the early days. But he said that the Bob actually came out of the trough when they were testing. So that's obviously not not a not a great situation. So just just we just had a lot of things where we invested a lot of resources, a lot of time and then it just didn't quite make it and it, it just made it tough to uh, we needed more hits to really to really make the company carry on. And if we'd had some people that if we'd had some more of those people from California, some more of the older people we might have had enough experience, uh, enough more experience that we probably could have made some more of those things work. So let's talk about four items and then we'll go on to the, the big question at the very end. Here. Okay. Uh, you were there for X. Five and a half years. Oh, X Coaster. No, I was oh, gone. You were, you were gone by that. Okay. I was gone before X. Okay. My, my, last, my last ride was, or my last series of projects was the, the Circus Circus Luxor projects. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about um, what is Arrow's ultimate legacy? What is the legacy of Arrow development, in your opinion? Uh, my problem is that, that there's more than one Arrow. That, that's, the, that's the thing. There, there is the, the Morgan and Bacon days, the Camelot days, where they, uh, I mean, they could build anything. They could do no wrong. They did, they did uh, just some amazing stuff. And it, it, it's really sad that, you know, the antique cars and some of the things that they did 
that we weren't still selling those. I think if we had, I think if we had kept developing some of those, we could have kept selling some of that stuff. Um, you know, just just an amazing catalog of of product from that time period. Uh, but then again, there is so there's that there's there's all the stuff that they did the Disney stuff all of, uh, all of that kind of stuff just wonderful wonderful rides. Um, but then too there is there is uh, the big push that Arrow did leading up to Magnum and and the Ma the mega coaster. Um, I'm not sure anybody else was positioned at that time to do that. Uh, B and M was too, were too conservative to to do that at that time. And Inman, then was not what they are now. They were, they were. I mean, they were an importer mostly in, in the early days. They didn't start building their own rides until I don't know, probably around '85 or something like that. So, uh, and then um, I think the other thing is there were just so many companies that sprang off of Mero. Uh, you know, Morgan Manufacturing and and. The coaster business that Chance has is actually an offshoot of Arrow. Um, you know, and, and the coaster business that Vacoma has is actually an offshoot of Arrow. So there's a lot of company S and S, and they're uh, you know, are not S and S. I'm sorry. A, a lot of the S and S people are former Arrow people. So there's that. Uh, the the set point guys. Set point actually as as Arrow was. The, the version of Arrow I worked for was kind of coming apart. Uh, Joe and Joe actually picked out a lot of the really strong people out of Arrow that were that were seeing a sinking ship and, and pulled them into set point. So there's just a huge number of, of really strong Arrow people that are over there. So there, there's multiple legacies. There's the fantastic ride, early rides. There's the big coasters. I, I love, my favorite coaster is still a suspended. I love, uh, uh, Big Bad Wolf is probably the best, was the best, uh, but I love my, I, I did Top Gun and I did the uh, Vortex of Canada's Wonderland. I did the controls on both of those. I love both of those. They're great coasters and there's nothing like them anymore. So why are suspended unique now? Um, For the non-coaster fan who might be watching, why, why is a suspended coaster so unique and why are they so rare? They are, Unlike the the inverted the inverted coaster gives you a similar ride, but you are with the with the suspended coaster because it is weight dependent and it's dependent on how you sit in the ride and all of that. How you swing and everything is very dependent on who's sitting in that car, um, and so your ride can vary from and it can be temperature dependent as well. Uh, your ride can vary from from ride to ride. It, it's just, and it's a very smooth ride. I love how smooth those rides are. They work best when you have something where there's head choppers and scenery and, you know, they don't work, they're not a, a parking lot ride. But, um, you know, if you put them in an environment like Big, Big Bad Wolf or, or uh, those kind of rides, they're, they're a fabulous ride. Let's talk about Drock and Fire. Okay, so from my perspective, Drock and Fire was my pinnacle roller coaster for the control side. The ride itself was not good, but it was the only aero ride that, that I know of that ever made its published capacity. Normally, you know, we'd say, oh, it'll do 1,500 an hour and it does 1,200, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Gene Queen at Bush Williamsburg came up to me at ASTM a few years after we built it and told me he actually could exceed hour after hour our published capacity of 2,000 an hour. There's a lot of things we did. It, uh, when I worked under Joe Vandenberg, Joe had a policy that, that we would pick three things every year and make them better. It didn't have, matter what they were, but we had to pick three things on our rides and make them better every year. And so, Drock and Fire was our dual processor. Um, it had the booster tires. It had, we, we did a system called mini blocks that it allowed us to move the train and the ready brake at the same time that the station brake was moving and still meet everybody's safety standards. 
So it was the pinnacle for the control system. Had the multi-position storage track. It was it was some of my best work. But it was proof that we couldn't keep up with B&M. It was proof that our train could not do the things that B&M could do. Why couldn't it do it? The I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to talk mechanical for a minute, but the biggest thing is the aero, you've heard the heart line thing, you know, the B&M is all the heart line, they designed the ride around this point on the rider here. The reference point on the aero track was the low rail. So everything, they, they say in 3, 3D where this low rail was and then everything else was, was referenced to that low rail. Well the problem is when you go from here to here, your reference position just shifted three feet. So every time you had something where your low rail changed, you would have a bad transition. You just There's just no way to make that smooth. And that is where all the bad transitions happen on an aero coaster. It's when you go from here to here. And so because, and they came to the Heartline concept later. Uh, Tennessee Tornado is a great example of one that was built, I don't know if it's perfect Heartline, but it's much better. But it was too late. By that time, there, there, there wasn't enough there to, to keep the company going. But it, it, it was that low rail concept that we just could not make, make the ride smooth enough to match what B&M was doing. Is there anything else you want to add? I think I've got everything I need. No, I think that's it. I, if I start telling, oh, I do have one great story. Okay, so I told you that Dick Taylor uh, had been at Arrow before Ron was. So he told me a great Ron Toomer story that, that I think needs to be in here. One day, Ed and Carl were um, trying to figure something out and Ron had done a design and it, they didn't like it and it wasn't working. So they got out a piece of chalk and they sketched out on the floor what they wanted to do. And then they got the guys in the shop to build it to the sketch on the floor. And then they brought Ron in to document the sketch on the floor. <laughs>